and we're going to open up more the mystery of this desert place of prayer, this desert place of contemplation that we dwell in with the Lord and with one another. People who want flashy things, look elsewhere. People who want the Lord, come to the desert, like you all have today. And when we're in the desert, we're not alone. Revelation 12, 1 through 6, spend some time with that. I can't speak too much about that today. Revelation 12, 1 through 6, our Blessed Mother is given a place prepared for her in the desert. Revelation 12, 6, and she has those birth pains, not her natural birth pains when Jesus was born, but the birth pains for the sake of the church. But St. Paul says, Our Lady can say all the more, my little children with whom I'm in travail and birth pains until Christ be born to you. So when we're in this desert place of arid prayer, dry prayer, all the pain and anguish involved and faithfulness to prayer and the dryness, you're sharing in Mary's mission. You're sharing in our Blessed Mother's mission as she abides in the desert place with us. So it's no mistake that this room is painted blue, very blue. She's with us. She's with us. So we'll uh, turn first to her, asking for her intercession. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and may our hope of death. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. You who breathe over the unformed waters, you who breathe under the unformed places in the desert, rest upon us, overshadow us, anoint our prayer in the silence and in the aridity, draw us deeper into the mystery. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, says to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone. That's what I want to talk about today. The hidden manna and the new name given to us. The new name which is also hidden in this life. The new name is how God sees us, who we are in Christ. As we enter more deeply into loving union with the hidden manna, we enter more deeply into our new name, which is also hidden. Much of what happens in life happens on a much more superficial level. It might be kind of odd to like put a percentage to it, but the way that God sees our life, evaluates our life, probably, I don't know, 75% of it is interior, right? Two men can be working in the same job, doing the same external things basically throughout the day. Two people in the same job. One interiorly is doing it to make money, for greed, to climb up the corporate ladder. The other man, same basic external activities, is doing it interiorly for love of his family. To raise a family. To doing it for the glory of God. So much of what we do in life and the eternal value it has is hidden. It's interior. Like the hidden manna, our new name is hidden. And by dwelling with the hidden manna, we come to live more in our new name, which remains hidden in this life for the most part, but will be manifest on the last day. 
So we're going to use scripture, especially John 6, to open up this theme of hidden manna, but also St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, who dwelt in this silent place of desert prayer and felt the Lord give her a new name. She got a glimpse of it already in this life. Praise of glory was the name she felt she received from the Lord. Even in this life, she was beginning to live as a praise of glory. To sing already in this life her eternal sanctus, her eternal hymn of praise of God with all the saints and angels, didn't have to wait until the next life. Begins now in the hiddenness. Her eternal sanctus, her eternal holy, 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 and all that she does for the Lord. Love of Him. Everything for the praise of His glory. This new name that Revelation 2 speaks of comes back again in Revelation 3.12. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him, this is Jesus speaking, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. Right? Jesus is about writing his own new name on us as we grow in holiness, as we grow in union with him. How is Jesus' name new? Well, it's him and his life now lived by his mystical body. It's him and his body brought to full maturity. It's Jesus speaking his new name over us, members of the body united to the head. Christ's life in us brought to fulfillment. And that will sparkle out in glory on the last day. And now it's a hidden name. We catch glimpses of it, but it's a hidden name. Hidden manna. Hidden name. So let's think a little bit more about the hidden manna. It's common in the tradition to speak about contemplative prayer as hidden manna. Our desert prayer as hidden manna. John of the Cross does this. Dark Night, Book 2, Chapter 16. But many others do it as well. Francis de Sales, Pseudo Dionysius. It's a beautiful image of contemplation, of prayer in the desert, hidden manna. And even the scriptures point in this direction, imply it. It's in the scriptures. Right? The hidden manna, the manna which looks so bland on the outside, is the bread of angels. It contains every taste, tells us the book of wisdom. The hidden manna, which seems so ordinary, common, even bland, dry on the outside, is the bread of angels and contains everything, contains every taste, contains all sweetness. Contemplation is like that. Arid desert prayer is like that. It can seem like nothing's going on on the outside. At first, we can turn away from it. Uh, this kind of prayer is so boring sitting silently before the Lord. What's happening here? And we can get turned away from it because of that. Just like the Israelites in the desert could turn away from the manna. Ah, what is this? Right, that's what manna literally means. God gives them the bread of angels. God gives them food from above. And they say, what is this? Ah. God gives us deeper prayer. He gives us that prayer from above. And we can too be like, what is this? Because it comes to us in dryness. It comes to us in the difficulty of prayer. It comes to us in kind of an ordinary blandness. But it's the bread of angels. It's the bread of life. So this life of living with the hidden manna in this life requires faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by faith, not by sight. Truly with you, God is hidden. Isaiah 45. St. John of the Cross points out that even in the most open manifestation of the Lord in this life, there's still something of a hiddenness 
to it, perceived only through faith. Faith, hope, and charity. We tend to live on the outside, on the superficial level of things. But in the desert, we go deeper and we pierce through mere appearances to the reality, through faith, through hope, through charity. We pierce through the mere appearances of our life to the deeper reality of what God is shaping us to be, our new name, what he's making of us in the ordinary events of day-to-day -day life, amidst the Holy Family, the hidden life of Jesus and Nazareth the hidden life of our lives before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Most people want to run away from this deeper place of life. It's easier to have our senses stimulated on the outside, but to face the deeper meaning of things and begin to live already our life in eternity. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, as she's writing to her blood sister, Gweet, who has two or three kids and is taken up in the task of the household, St. Elizabeth points out to her blood sister, hey, you're living the same spirituality I'm living in Carmel. Faith, hope, charity. In the monastery, we don't get beyond faith, hope, and charity. St. Elizabeth of the Trinity loved to emphasize the three within. The blessed Trinity dwelling in our souls as in a, as in a temple through grace. God is more present to us than we are to ourselves. The Blessed Trinity is more interior to us than we are to ourselves, but he's present there in hiddenness. To receive that in faith, to abide with the three within throughout our day-to-day -day lives, in that deep interiority, and to live out that deep interiority in our day-to-day -day lives, we need times like this, in the desert, where the interior dimension comes out, rises to the surface more. Our faith, hope, and charity is renewed, is strengthened as we pray before the Lord. And we keep that interior dimension alive at work in our day-to-day -day lives. Right, I don't want to waste my life living on the outside. I want to live from the inside out. I don't want to waste my time living on the outside. I want to live from the inside out. I don't want my life to be wasted away in external, trivial things. I want to build my life on things that will last into eternity. Love. And things built on love. The truth of God, the truth we have in the inspired word of God received through faith. I want to live on that level as I go about my day-to-day -day tasks. I want to live on that level, deep communion with Jesus, like Mary and Joseph had in those hidden years of Nazareth, amidst their day-to-day -day chores and tasks. Contemplation is hidden manna. Ordinary, bland, dry on the outside, it can seem, what is this? Well, it's the bread of the angels. It's a deeper intimacy with the Lord. It's a deeper communion with the Lord. But we have to adjust to it. We're not apt for it immediately. We need to spend time in silence to be reconfigured towards these spiritual realities which are hidden from our eyes. Right? We're used to living in a visible world. To live with our lives built on invisible things, it takes a whole transformation of our being, a whole reorientation of our being. And that happens in the desert. Faithfulness, when it's difficult. Contemplation is the hidden manna, because the Lord Jesus himself is the hidden manna. John chapter 6, Jesus says that about himself. He's the bread come down from heaven. And when Jesus speaks those words 2,000 years ago, he's not just speaking to those disciples 2,000 years ago. Jesus knows that these words are going to echo through all history. That these words are for us too. Jesus 
calls himself the bread from heaven, the hidden manna, because he knows at that time he's going to abide with us throughout the age of the church in the Eucharist. He's the hidden manna. As we become before our Lord here in the Eucharist, through our natural eyes, we just see common, ordinary bread. It can seem so common, bland. People who don't know about Eucharistic adoration, they can be like, what is this? Well, it's the manna from heaven. It's the bread of angels. It contains every taste. As we penetrate the surface through faith, hope, and charity, our souls are satisfied. Our hunger is satisfied. Our thirst is quenched, even as it's kindled. And we thirst for more and hunger for more. Contemplation is hidden manna because Jesus himself is hidden manna. Jesus multiplies the loaves and the people come to him. And Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Right? Don't work for things that are going to pass away. We need to be engaged in the things of this world. We need to be responsible with our task, our work, your jobs, uh, temporal things. But don't be so caught up in them that you forget eternity. Don't work for things that will perish. Work for things that will last in, into eternity. Love. The things built on the rock of Christ. Things done for the glory of God. Right? There's a hiddenness to this dimension of our life. You know, I meet so many people. They're in difficult marriages. Or they're caring for an elderly parent. And things don't always go so well as they're caring for their elderly parent. There's tension in the household. The elderly parent's not so kind all the time. The marriage that the person's working on, you don't see results all the time. Husband's not coming back to Mass, or vice versa. The husband can't convince the wife to come back to Mass. Difficult household situations. And if you just get caught up on just that level, you can be like, what's the point? Where's God in all this? Don't work for food that will perish. Work the things that will endure to eternal life. The love that you pour out as you care for your mother. The love that you pour out as you're patient with your spouse and try to draw him or her back to the Catholic faith. Work for things that will endure into eternity. Begin to sing your eternal song to even now. Put the emphasis there. And yeah, we try to strive for results in this life, but ultimately that's secondary to the food that endures into eternity, building our lives so that we'll become the people we want to be for all eternity. Patient, gentle, giving of self, whatever the cost, giving of self when you don't even see the results. Work for the things that will endure into eternity. And there's a hiddenness to it all, right? That new name that God is fashioning you to be, that new being in Christ he's fashioning you to be, happens through all those struggles. As you try to build up your household, as you try to share the faith, all those frustrations are building you up to be who you're meant to be for all eternity. When you respond in love, when you respond in faith, when you respond in hope, hope in eternal things, even as things in this life don't always work out as we might want. <coughs> don't work for things that will perish, but for things that will endure into eternal life. Think of St. Rita of Pasha. Terrible marriage. Her husband was abusive. She was steadfast. She did her best. She didn't fix the marriage, but she became a saint through it. She labored for the food that endures into eternity. Love. The Lord giving ourselves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. They said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. The work of God is to believe. To believe that you are singing your eternal sanctus. To believe that your efforts in love will bear fruit, maybe in this life, but certainly in the next life. To believe that God is about a hidden work in your souls and in our life. That the hidden manna is creating you according to your new hidden name, which is the name of the new Jerusalem. That the kingdom of God is among us, is around us. And our spiritual efforts, even if we don't get to see visible results, are making a difference as the city of God does build up. You know, I think sometimes that, you know, like a, a mother or father who can spend so much time praying for a wayward son or a wayward daughter, and like, oh, the son's not converting. Oh, the daughter's not coming back. But if you keep praying, you keep offering sacrifice, you keep fasting, offering things up, you can be bearing fruit in a son or a daughter on the other side of the world and not see it and not get to see it until the last day. Praying for your son or daughter or family member is not just about that son or daughter or family member. It is about them, but it's also more. God can use our prayers and sacrifices in ways we don't see. God does use our prayers and sacrifices in ways we can't see. I think in the parish life, you know, Pastor A, Pastor B can be doing kind of similar things. Parish A explodes with great fruitfulness. Parish B does not. But I think Parish B, the pastor, his works are bearing fruit in Parish A. <laughs> not his own parish. Uh, we're interconnected, right? As a body of Christ. And the things that you do in your family, the acts of love, in your own call, it can be bearing fruit in ways you can't see. So to trust, it's hidden manna. It's a hidden name. It's a hidden interior work the Lord is about. So the work of God is that you believe. You believe. That you bring all that, all the material of day-to-day -day life, you bring that before the Lord here, the hidden man, and you believe as you unite everything up to him. You believe that he will have the final victory. That love will have the last word as you build your life on love. This is the work of God, to believe. And this is what we do in adoration. We bring it all together, uniting it to the Lord Jesus, the offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, trusting in the fruitfulness of this grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, that it may bear much fruit. And how do we most unite everything to this grain of wheat? By ourselves becoming that grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies to self. Dies for the need to see visible results. Dies to this world that we might rise with great fruitfulness and new life. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. And a little bit later, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You know, that can surely be raising up in this world as the Lord does his beautiful work. But even if there's not that, we know that this promise is invincible. 
He will raise it up on the last day. All our efforts done in hiddenness, all our efforts at charity, seeking forgiveness, even if the other person doesn't receive it, it's not in vain. He's going to raise it all up on the last day. We get a foretaste of that at Mass, the elevation, the through him, with him, in him. To you, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours. In this elevation of the Eucharist, we get a foretaste of the Lord Jesus raising everything up on the last day. Everything built on love, everything that was hidden. Hidden manna, our hidden name, our hidden works of love. He's going to raise up and make bear much fruit. Last five minutes. I started five minutes late. So. <laughs> <laughs> Last five minutes. A little more on this new name. The hidden new name. Contemplation is hidden manna because Jesus himself is hidden manna. And that's how he abides with us in the age of the church. Right? That's why Jesus in John 6 describes himself this way. That's how it made it into the scriptures. Because Jesus speaks this truth to us anew. Day after day as we come in the Adoration Chapel. He is the hidden manna. There's always something hidden about our relationship with Christ. To accept that. And just very briefly, there are three modes of the Lord's hiddenness. Hidden here in the Eucharist. Hidden in the depths of our heart, the indwelling trinity. The soul who's in a state of grace. John the Cross, spiritual canticle one. Opens that up beautifully. And the third mode of Jesus' hiddenness is in our neighbor, those we serve. What you did to the least ones of these, you did unto me. This is the hope of glory, Christ in you. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The third mode of God's hiddenness in our neighbor. And as we grow in faith in one of those three modes of hiddenness of God, we grow in the others. The more we come to see Jesus in all faith in the hidden manna, the more we're able to see Jesus in the distressing disguise of our neighbor, in the disfigured face of the poor and suffering. As our faith grows in one of those modes of hiddenness, it grows in the other. The Eucharist, indwelling Trinity, in our neighbor. And as we live that out, we are being transformed. Our new name, what God has made us to be for all eternity. He's accomplishing through these things, but it's a hiddenness now. This slight momentary affliction, St. Paul says, is winning for us an eternal weight of glory. Because we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is hidden. And that's the primary, the, the fundamental meaning of the word mystical. Hiddenness in secret. <clears throat> that conversation with the Lord in secret. And the work of love he's accomplishing in our souls and in our world today is like leaven. It's underground. It's an underground work of love. We don't always get to feel it, see it, experience, but we know it by faith. He's accomplishing in us that, that beautiful new creation he's promised. In this new name that we have, we'll only see it in heaven who were created to be for all eternity, but we can't catch a glimpse of it in this life. For St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, she felt the Lord reveal something of this new name to her in three names she received. Number one, Elizabeth, house of God. And that's what her baptismal name meant. And she was struck when a Carmelite nun explained that to her when she was a little girl. That her name, Elizabeth, meant house of God. So as she joined Carmel, she becomes Elizabeth, house of God, of the Trinity, the indwelling Trinity. That's who she is in Christ. That's who you and I are in Christ, a dwelling place of God, a house of God, a house of the blessed Trinity. Later in life, St. Elizabeth felt she received a second name from the Lord that was so important for her. Praise of glory from Ephesians chapter 1. To the praise of God's glorious grace. Right? He chose us from all eternity. Every blessing in the heavenly places he has given to us in the beloved. He has redeemed us, washed us, made us holy, 
pure and spotless in his sight. To the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, that we might exist for the praise of his glory. That we might already now live that eternal sanctus, that eternal praise of God. Praise of glory, to have everything ordered towards that. House of God, and when we live that out, we live it out as a praise of glory. Then the third name that St. Elizabeth felt she received from the Lord, that helps open up that new name she now sees in heaven. The third name is host of praise, sacrifice of praise. She dies at age 27, and when she's on her sick bed with Addison's disease, she feels the Lord speak to her this name, that she's to be host the laudis, host of praise, sacrifice of praise. Right, even our sufferings come together in God's plan. Even your struggles in your household, with your spouse, or with someone else you're caring for, or whatever. Even when things don't go right, it doesn't thwart God's plan when we respond with love. When we respond building our lives on eternal things. Host of praise. Nothing in this world can get in the way of God's plan when we respond with love. Nothing but sin can get in the way of God's plan. And when we return in faith and love, even sin is overcome. Hostia laudis, victim of praise, sacrifice of praise. That's what we want to be as well. So last thing, one of the things that really attracts me about St. Elizabeth of the Trinity is this phrase that she uses, the invincible fortress of holy recollection. And she encourages her sister, her blood sister, amidst her household duties, to live in that invincible fortress of recollection. We learn to enter into that invincible fortress of holy recollection here in the Adoration Chapel. And as we go forth from the chapel, we can dip down into that interior garden. We can dip down into that cell of self-knowledge, as St. Catherine of Siena described it, that cell of the soul, that cell of the heart. We can abide with our beloved three more and more throughout our day-to-day -day tasks. And it is an invincible fortress. Nothing can touch it when we're rooted in God's love like that. When we're rooted in the truth that God speaks over us. Right? The world tells us many different things about ourselves. Other people, not so kind, not so charitable, not so rooted in God, can say terrible things about us, things that aren't true. We ourselves can even say terrible things to ourselves from woundedness, from lies we've told to ourselves and that we've come to believe. And to enter into this invincible fortress of holy recollection is to enter into that place of truth, God's truth. It's not like a shutting yourself out, shutting yourself apart from the world. It's about rooting yourself anew in the love of God in that place of contact with him in the depths of our interiority and to let him speak his truth over you anew. So when St. Elizabeth describes this invincible fortress of holy recollection on her last retreat, day 12, here are phrases that she uses to describe this invincible fortress of holy recollection. And we see that it's a place of grace. It's a place of God's love. It's a place of God's truth. Right? And when we're rooted anew in God's truth and love, we're able to face the task of the day. We're able to face the difficult situations in faith, in hope, in love, in a way that will echo through all eternity. So here's how Elizabeth describes this invincible fortress of holy recollection as a grace space. She says, this is Christ's work in every soul of goodwill. And it is the work that his immense love, his exceeding love, is eager to do in me. All right? That invincible fortress is a place of Christ's work of love. She says, he wants me to be, he wants to be my peace so that nothing can distract me. Right? In that invincible fortress of recollection, we touch the Prince of Peace. And he himself becomes more and more our peace 
that the world can't touch, a peace that transcends all understanding. She says, it is by the blood of his cross that he will make peace in my little heaven, my little soul. This invincible fortress is the place of the blood that purifies, enlivens us. She says in the same paragraph about the invincible fortress of recollection, he will fill me with himself. When we recollect ourselves, we allow the Lord to fill us, our minds, our affections, everything with himself. She says again, he will make me live again with him by his life. Dipping down into our interior garden, we renew our contact with the Lord as a branch on the vine. He will make me live again with him by his life. And finally, in the same paragraph, she says, And if I fall at every moment in a holy, confident faith, I will be helped up by him. Place of grace, place of renewal. So we ask the Lord Jesus, the hidden manna, who's accomplishing in us that work of that new hidden name, that we might dwell more and more deeply and continually in this invincible fortress of holy recollection, that his designs of love might be accomplished in our souls and in our world today. Amen. Amen. Well, Father Ignatius talk about being given a new name. Um, I may not be so advanced like Elizabeth Trinity, but this is my story. It's a different kind of name that everybody else, everybody in the world is given. But many of us don't know that, even in the church. And um, I want to start with yesterday experience in the plane. Um, and my husband doesn't know. My son doesn't know because he was asleep. But I was meditating on um, First Corinthians just by accident. God, God does that. Uh, and I've never seen this. It's 1 Corinthians 2, um, verse 12, and it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And that, that's this translation, and I'm using the one on my phone, which... I think it's better. I'm sorry. It's just a Protestant one because I'm a convert. But this uh, um, translation said that so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. And I don't know. I just start crying. <laughs> because like Father Ignatius said, it's this new name that's given to me. And... Now I've been a Christian for 35 years, Catholic, coming to seven years. Um, this new name keeps opening up and, and things that I cannot even perceive, things that I cannot understand, and it gets better and better. And it's like, what? Really? Like, what is this? Like, mana. <laughs> like, this is too good to be true. So I was just crying in the airplane. I cry in different places, strange places. It's okay. My family's used to it. But the yes and but they need to stay used to it. And um, my testimony is this. If I read First Corinthians um, chapter one, it is really boasting on the Lord. I'm not here to teach you, but I'm here because of his mercy of what he's done in my life and that's why I'm here. I'm not probably qualified to speak. I don't have the degrees like these three guys. I don't. I have a big mouth like them maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so 1 Corinthians says, For consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. 
God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast of the Lord. So um, I'm boasting. This is the time that I can boast. <laughs> I'm going to share my story. Um, this is my story of conversion to become Protestant. And then after that, I've been a Protestant for almost 30 years and then I became a Catholic. Um, my story is a combination of the story of St. Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, the story of St. Mary Magdalene, who was delivered from seven demons, and the story of St. Paul, who was a forgiven murderer. This is my Lazarus story. 35 years ago, when I was 19 years old, God saved me from an attempted suicide. At that time, I was living in San Francisco. My boyfriend of two years had just gone home after graduating from college. He had introduced me to drugs and some criminal activities. When we fought and were high on drugs, I would throw my chihuahua, we have a little chihuahua dog, across the room and I would hurl plates and cups, creating holes in the walls. I didn't care about anything life, the future, it was all dark and hopeless. We would party until sunrise and sleep until afternoon. I remember bailing him out of jail because he had punched a policeman. Life was, sun was fun, not, it was not fun. I was living in a beautiful apartment with a skylight on the ceiling overlooking the Bay Bridge. This is still in San Francisco. I could see the stunning Bay Bridge, especially at night, the waters of the bay, and occasionally hear the sea lions barking. For one week, I fell into a deep depression, and for three nights in a row, I had three dreams every night. In all the dreams, I almost died. The dreams were otherworldly, spiritual in nature. They were priests, witches, the ashes of dead people, and many demons. I knew that if I died in one of the dreams, I would not wake up and would actually die. On the third day, in my third dream, I saw a helicopter crash into the skylight of my apartment. I have like this uh, window, I'm not window, glass ceiling. Suddenly, the entire apartment was engulfed in flames. Instantly, I knew where I was. I was standing at the edge of hell. The flames were about 40 feet away from me, and it looked like a cave of fire. At the outer edge of the flame that engulfed the cave, there was a wall made of rock about knee high which resembled the entrance to hell. I was already behind this wall standing, but not in the fire of hell yet. Then I saw a man standing outside this rock wall. He looked at me. All I remember were his eyes. They were the kindest, most beautiful eyes I had ever seen. Thank <laughs> you. 
and love and that surpasses all happiness and joy. He looked at me and then reached out his hands as if asking me to reach out to him. I, am, I immediately trust this man. I trusted his soul, his heart, which I could see through his eyes. I reached out to his hands and he took me out of the wall, out of hell. After that dream, which didn't mean much to me at that time, I decided to end my life. Alone in my apartment, in the dark of the night, I took one bottle of sleeping pills. I hugged my dog under the blanket, closed my eyes and said goodbye to the world for the last time. I took the pills around 11 p.m. At 2 a.m., a friend knocked on my door and asked if I wanted to join him for a late meal in Chinatown since it was the only place open. I woke up, opened the door, and went with him. He didn't even know what I had just done. No poisoning, no effect, nothing. I once ministered to a young lady who did the same thing, and she had to be taken to the hospital to get her stomach pumped. But for me, nothing. <clears throat> And it wasn't until 21 years later, as a Christian, God showed me who that man was that took me out of hell. I learned this from a child prodigy named Akiana Kramaric. I don't know if you know about her. Who at the age of eight, based on her visions and dreams, painted a famous portrait called Prince of Peace. She painted the face of Jesus that I saw in that dream. In her painting, Jesus had the exact face, eyes, and short jet black hair of the man I saw in my dream. Like Lazarus, Jesus had raised me from the dead and saved me from hell. This is my Mary Magdalene story. Because I did not recognize that it was Jesus who saved me from suicide, nothing changed in my life. Drugs, a series of boyfriends, traveling, looking for love in the wrong places, and living in various cities, states, countries, and continents, trying to escape pain, Continued. I broke off two engagements. The first, a very wealthy son of a banking family. I remember asking my mother on my engagement day, 
Why am I so miserable on my engagement day? The advice she gave me was, all men are bleep. <laughs> anyway, might as well marry a rich bleep than a poor bleep. <laughs> That's her wisdom. But don't get me wrong, my mom is a saint. She is the most selfless person I've ever met but she was a very wounded saint. With many unhealed wounds, we both suffer from the pain coming from my father. So at the age of 25, six years after my first suicide attempt, I decided to end my life again. This time I was back home with my parents in Indonesia, where I'm from. As background, you need to know that my mom and I were involved in the occult since I was 13 years old. In Indonesia, black magic is very common. Probably common here, I don't know. Caribbean, South America, Haiti. Uh, in Indonesia, yeah, one of the ways to combat black magic is to go to a person, if, if you're not religious, who, who can reverse it with what you call white magic, which is essentially the same thing. They just cover up with more a pure facade. <laughs> the witch we went to was a very simple village lady living in a very poor house. And we would go to her and my mom would ask her to pray for us for health, for protection, and sometimes we would ask for personal advice. It was like fortune telling on steroids. She would then conduct a seance uh, session, which is a very great evil that is prohibited by the church. <clears throat> she would sit on the ground, legs crossed, hands folded, and she would hold a candle. She would usually start ch uh, chanting, and a spirit, which is demon, would possess her. Usually the same demons, plural, would come each time they take turn. This woman would change her voice, accent, and even body postures. A few of them will take turn talking to us. An old man with a long beard, as he always kind of touch his beard like this, with a Chinese accent a woman with a lo local royal dialect. Um, my mom was apparently one of her favorites. She was a very well-known, very powerful territorial demonic spirit in Indonesia, and she's known to claim a lot of lives. And another man also with a Chinese accent, who he said was a general, as he would ride a horse when he approached us, literally like, like this. Um, you can actually see these demons made into statue in my, many Chinese stores, restaurants, and homes that they, um, when they're worshiped. They all would drink different things that we offer, some like beer, the general one like beer, uh, some like tea, the, the queen one likes tea, the lady, and then some like more of the local food. So yeah, they, they would actually eat. Because of my involvement with the occult since the age of 13, a big door was opened to the demonic spirit in my life. Through this, this opening, I had invited a legion of demons to live inside of me. From experience, my warning to you is to never, ever, ever flirt with the dark side. However innocent, they pretend to be. Even something you think is just fun, like Ouija board, fortune telling, tarot card, white magic, or even horoscope. And I would add yoga. I would warn you also against, I was gonna say that, against yoga, <laughs> and any practice of syncretism and superstition. The devil always plays for keeps and will deceive you from its harm to eventually kill and destroy your soul for eternity. 
And our church has a very powerful sacrament to break the curses that comes from these activities, the sacrament of confession. An exorcist actually said that one confession is worth 100 exorcisms. At the age of 25, now back at my parents' house, I was about to attempt suicide for the second time. Life felt empty, dark, and pointless, and I wanted to end the pain. My plan was to consume all the medication in the house since the first one didn't work, and my mother had plenty. But God had already intervened even before this. <clears throat> that year, my mother's cousin, a devout Protestant, had pity on me, befriended me, and showed me for the first time unconditional love of Jesus. I always made fun of her mentions of God, saying that it was all just a nice, wishful fantasy. I would say, that's in your world, not in my world. However, her unconditional and persistent love, which I felt for the first time, proved to be fruitful. Instead of taking the pills, I called her. She came and stopped me from committing suicide. What happened over the next three nights changed my life forever. God intervened in a big way. Just like the first time God delivered me from suicide attempt when I was 19 years old, this again took three nights. Over the next three days, each night, my dog, a female golden mutt, would wake me up exactly at midnight. She'd run from the front yard to the back, barking so ferociously, as if a thousand people were about to breach our fence. And we had a big house, so from front to back. It felt like she was trying to wake me up to warn me. And afterwards, demons began to attack me, both externally and internally. Although I had experienced visions and dreams and physical sightings of demons before, this time I couldn't see them, but I could feel and hear them. Demons emerged from within me and physically assaulted me from the outside. They choked me, and I heard them leaving through my mouth and my stomach shrieking with terrifying sounds. In the middle of this, a voice urged me to pray the Our Father and Hail Mary prayers I knew from Catholic school. I was brought up in the Catholic school. Deep inside, I understood that God the Father, not Jesus, was expelling these demons out of me. The battle lasted all night with me drifting in and out of sleep, always aware that demons were being cast out. This process repeated on the second night at midnight when my dog would wake me up again, and I went through deliverance once more. <clears throat> on the third night, the scenario replayed. I couldn't sleep and was deeply shaken. The next day, our security guard found my dog dead. Her head was split open, her brain scattered on the ground. No one knew what had happened, but I knew. After three nights of this, I decided to stay at my aunt's house so I can rest. As soon as I returned to my house a few days later, suddenly I was converted. God powerfully came into my life. Jesus that suddenly became as real as you and me though invisible. I would speak with him all day. The sky suddenly seemed brighter and bluer. I instantly quit smoking and stopped swearing. I used to have more than one swear word in one sentence. <laughs> My dad called me a walking miracle. <laughs> Suicide thoughts vanish and I felt like a completely different person, deeply in love with God. Jesus had rescued me from hell. The Father had delivered me from a legion of demons, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Those three nights showed me the tangible power of God combating darkness. My familiar, 
the way I'm familiar with the demonic through the occult had led me to encounter many demons and was assaulted by them. But those nights convinced me <coughs> of God's physical and spiritual power as he destroyed the devil's power and cast out the legion of demons from inside of me. Like Mary Magdalene, God has cast out a legion of demons from inside of me and set me free. So this is the last part. This is my St. Paul story. I was also a forgiven murderer. At the age of 15, I went to a boarding school in California, thousands of miles from home. Uh, it was a very strict Christian boarding school. The school was filled with international students or American kids who were being given a last chance to reform themselves before being sent to juvenile hall. Love this school. Without my knowing, the dean of the school had tapped my phone. He found out that instead of going to Los Angeles to visit a friend for the holidays, I had gone to Hawaii where my boyfriend lived and had my first abortion. Immediately, I was expelled from the school. I couldn't even go back to my room to get my things. I guess I was a big scandal, a big shame for the so-called Christian school. Then at the age of 17, after I had now been introduced to drugs, alcohol, and nightlife, now living in San Francisco, I had another abortion. And after my first attempt of suicide, at the age of 19, I had another one, three. Three of my own children I had murdered. But at that time, I didn't know these were babies alive within me. Souls, gifts from God. Like many of pro-abortionists, sin had blinded me. I could not see. I was deceived to believe that they are, these are just clumps of flesh. Sin makes people stupid. Also, wounds in my heart had made me dead. I was numb, I couldn't feel, I couldn't care less for my life or my future, let alone anybody else's. Abortion not only kills the baby, but it also kills the mother. I believe the very deep wounds from my father and my involvement in the occult have opened the door to substance abuse and eventually the taking of lives, my own and my own children. And yet after the gravest sin of committing multiple murders, instead of leaving me in hell, the Father sent Jesus to take me out of it. Instead of leaving the legion of demons inside of me to torment me for life and take my life the second time, the Father delivered me and cast the legion of demons out of me. God raised me from the dead as he did Lazarus, delivered me from legion of demons like Mary Magdalene, and poured mercy and grace into my life as he did to a murderer like St. Paul. Not only that, this is the new name, he adopted me and made me his own, his own beloved daughter. Instead of punishment deserving eternal hell, he forgave me and blessed me. He gave me three children of my own, one for each of the babies I had killed. Such is the Father's love for all of us. His grace and mercy know no bounds. As it is written in 1 John 3.1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we 